Running a game is what the organizers uh, called my talk. And running a game is everything with running a game. It's a lot of stuff, but I will try to focus on the hands-on experience. I will try to tell you from the forefront of the trenches of running a game uh, and come with some hands-on tips on what to do and what not to do. I could have called these slides the perfect plan. Because that's what you need when you're running a game. You need to have everything in order before you do the game. And if it is the perfect plan, then everything will work out as it should. I could also call it keep calm and build the ship while sailing. Because that is what happens most of the time. That you have to be able to uh, react to what happens while the game is running because the players will not do as you thought they would do. Or I could call it keep calm and build the ship while drowning because that happens sometimes. This builds on top of all of the faders, but I think the faders that matters most is the openness it matters if you are transparent, if you need to give a lot of information to the players, or if you need to coordinate information between the players, then it matters for you as a game master on how to run the game, how much work you have. If you are a secret game master, then you need to be able to coordinate all the secrets and they have to be uh, given out in the right amount at the right times and so on. That affects how you are a game master. Scenography, if you have a 360 illusion, then it takes a lot of energy to keep that illusion alive at all times during the game. Or on the other end, if you use the symbolism instead, then you have to be able to put those symbols into game. For instance, if I wanted to uh, give the illusion that there was an aircraft traveling over here, I had to press play on the south system at the right time, so there would be an aircraft uh, flying over the house. The game master style, of course, means a lot to how to game master, if I'm active or passive. And even if I, if, if I am passive, there's a lot of stuff that I have to take care of um, behind the scenes. Then there is the game mechanics, as uh, Jok talked about today. If I am intrusive, then I am out there and doing the game mastering. If I am discreet, then it takes a lot of energy to try to do it in discreet. And the pressure on players, it takes some energy to uh, have the floor flooded with water and keeping the temperature down and making sure that everyone is hungry and tired at all times. <laughs> On the other hand, if I want to pretend, then it takes energy to keep them fed and warm and happy. Game Master or Dungeon Master comes from this book. And Game Master, in my head, it sounds like you are a, a tamer of something. You are the master of something. You try to master a game. And it's a big wild animal that you have to keep in place. That's at least how I think about it. At least you are in charge of the game. You are the one that are running the game. You are the one that chooses the game. You are the one that introduces it to the players and make it happen and closing it down and so on. You are in charge of the experience for the players. You may be the designer. Back in the days, that was the most normal thing. Nowadays, a lot of people make games that are rerunnable, and other people will take your games, and they will be the game master of your game. For instance, Snaphane. It's not Peter who designed Snaphane, but Peter is running the game. He is the game master. He is in charge here at the summer school. Traditionally, the game master represented the world. The players had the characters, but everything else, sitting around the table rolling the dice, everything else was the game master describing the world, the weather, playing the non-player characters, the NPCs, and 
um, when the players interacted with the world, then the world should react to that. So everything else but the characters was the game master's responsibility. Nowadays, games have changed, and as you can see, that's not always how it is. A game master can be in the game. A game master can, like in Snaphen, be in running the game from the inside. Or a game master can stand on the outside and look in and try to pull the levers and twist the knobs and try to make the game go in the right direction. All in all, a game master is not one thing. You can't talk about game mastering as one single thing. Game mastering is like driving a thousand different vehicles. You have to be able to uh, maneuver in a boat or a small scooter or drive a tank. Games are not the same. I am good at driving some vehicles and there are some vehicles that I'm really bad at driving. And I know this by I have tried to drive them and I know that there are some games that I shouldn't drive. I should drive the one over here, uh, because when I drive a tank, then I drive my players down. And that's, uh, <laughs> I run them over and that's not a good idea. Uh, this picture is from a game that uh, I was a part of making some years ago. It's called Delirium. It, uh, I will use examples from this today. It was a strong experience for 36 players, played in a big black box. Uh, and it was about love and uh, madness in an insane asylum. Uh, and we as Game Masters tried to control everything. We were 15 organizers running a game for 36 players. So almost one hour organizer to every second player. Uh, and this was our plan. We had break down the hours of the game, 52 play hours, into quarters. And every quarter says what would happen. There were different kinds of playing time that had colors. And down under there were what kind of NPCs, plot items and so on should be there at what time. We ve very uh, quickly we found out that it was uh, impossible to track all this. So we created the arrow. So every hour we would go in and ritually move the arrow one hour <laughs> and we would celebrate that the game was still running. <laughs> At the halfway mark, I made a little star just to say this is the halfway mark. And when the arrow was put there, everything broke down. <laughs> <laughs> but we, uh, we managed to mend it and get the game back on track and land it. I will talk about more about how this is difficult and why it doesn't work. <laughs> oh. This is a picture from Delirium. And Delirium is an example of all three of these. When you talk about games, you can talk about different kinds of games. A sandbox game is when you as a game designer create a box that the players can go into and they can play around. They can make the sand castles they want to make. You have created the box so it has the right limits, the right amount of sand, the right tools, so they can just play around. Um, then we have what we in uh, our group, our organizer group called Pearls um, on a Threat that you go in and then you create certain events at certain times to steer the game in the right direction. Then the rest of the time you let go and let the players do whatever they like to and then you go in again and you make a ritual or a wedding or a fire in the church or whatever to steer the game in the right direction. <laughs> and then there is the last that we call railroading. It's like tracks, it goes in this direction and you put the players on them and then you just go in that direction. There is nowhere else to go. This comes very much from Dungeons and Dragons, uh, where the game master would put the players in a dungeon and there was only one way to go, railroading them through the dungeon. The Illyrium used all three of them. At some times we let the players free in, the, in this big black box. Sometimes we went in and we made events so that we would steer the game and sometimes there were very specific events that we wanted to happen and we railroaded for a time and then we let go. All is okay and you can use it as you like to. 
When you game master a game, size does matter. This is a model of Capo, of the location, and I will walk out of the frame. <laughs> this is the intro area where uh, all the players came in through the tunnel. Then you have the different playing areas of the different tribes. In the middle here you had a big, um, a big platform that was raised up four meters where the uh, organizers could sit and steer the game with light and sound. They could put in food into the game. In here you had audience coming in looking at the game and out here you have the off-game area. All of this needed to work for the game to work. If you have 20 players, then there's not that much to take care of if you're just in a black box with 20 players. But if you have 120 or 180 players inside a big uh, structure, big mechanism like this, then size does matter. You need more people, you need more time, you need better plans. <coughs> this is a picture from White Death from some of you who haven't played it yet. Um, White Death has a workshop before the game that creates the characters. And the game itself is very dependent on that workshop. I would not be able to write the characters for White Death and just give them to you and you would read them and go in and play the game like if you had been through the workshop. So you can't really talk about the game as something by itself. It is very dependent on what happens before the game. And during the last five, 10 years, we've been better and better at creating things before the game um, and trying to build up to the game. So it matters very much what kind of players you have and how you have treated them. Have you built an example? Is there trust between the players? Do they have characters that are playable and so on before they go into the game? When you then are in the game, it's important that you keep the promise to your players. This is a picture from Cabo. Uh, it is uh, one of the guards. And as um, Oliver talked about, there were three levels of torture that you could choose before the game. If we have suddenly as organizers in that game decided to shift those around, well, that guy, he could use a little more torture and so on. <laughs> it wouldn't be that good. And you need to keep your promise to the players. Also, if there's something you have said, maybe not something they have chosen like a torture level, but if you say something to the players, the game will be like this. If you change it, you have to tell them. And if you promise them something, you have to keep it. <laughs> this is a game called Black Sun that I made uh, at Black Box Copenhagen. It was very dependent on technique, uh, technical stuff. Um, in the middle we have a bonfire, there was a projection from, uh, from the roof down on a, a white uh, circle on the ground and we had an animation of a bonfire from the top and we had speakers uh, with a <laughs> sound like this from the bonfire and it looked like a bonfire and it uh, radiated uh, red light out into the players so it looked like they were sitting around bonfire. This was cool. We also had a very big wall uh, two and a half times four meters with a projection of the sun and the moon coming up and down which controlled the flow of the game. That sounded like a good idea but when you start the game and the only pace uh, in the game is controlled by a projection and you cannot go in and control the game by yourself just have to sit and look at the pace of the game then it is difficult to control it. And we only found that out when we did the game. We hadn't tested it before because it took so much time to build all of this technical stuff. And during the game, I think a quarter into the game, we found out this is not working. Instead of panicking, we decided to just lean back and enjoy the misery. <laughs> and just see our big project not working, but that was okay. 
if there is fire in someone or something, or if you can see a, pl a player really hurting, then you need to go in and stop the game. <laughs> but if you see something that is not working a bit, and you haven't, and you don't have the possibility to break the game in acts or uh, during the next morning and so on, just let it flow. You can always do the game again another time. And it might not be that uh, bad as it looks from the outside. Um, yes, control is an illusion. Game mastering is a bit like herding cats. That you can try to control it, but you can't control everything of it. So just relax and be aware that control is an illusion. This is important. Things might go wrong in the game. And if it's not something you have done specifically, let's say two players have a bad experience together. It's not your fault as a game master that they have a bad experience, but it's your responsibility. You have to be able to take care of them and to do whatever you can to mend the things that have happened. But it is not your fault. You should not put it on your shoulders and blame yourself and say, I will never make a game again because something went wrong. But you should always take as much responsibility as you can handle and be sure where is that line. Organizer fatigue is a term that organizers will turn tired. It is of some odd reason quite normal that organizers use the last week before the game to work, 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 work and maybe not sleep. So when they start the game, they're like zombies and it's not the best state to be in to run a game without any sleep. So try to prepare beforehand. If you can print the 60 pages two weeks before and not two minutes before, then do it. But you have to know that you will be tired and organizer fatigue is normal. All the three big games I've made, after those I have slept for two weeks and I didn't walk to, want to talk to my co-organizers for that time. And that might not be the best uh, state to be in, but it's okay. And I have made games after that and we are still friends. But just know that creating at least the big games, it takes a lot of energy and that's all right. <coughs> this is, by the way, from Cabo and it's all the players and how long they were played and when they should go in the game and out of the game. And every time some player wanted to change when they were going out of the game, they had to change the whole um, projection they had on the wall. So I had to go in and fix everything of it because they hadn't created a system where they can just take one out and one in. So I had to rewrite everything. There was one organizer sitting for the whole run of that game just doing Excel to uh, make sure that everyone came in and out at the right time. Might not be the best way to do it <laughs> and it makes you tired. Okay. A game is a sequence of designable elements. You don't need to have all of these, but there is something before the game. That could be the website with the communication, that could be uh, the characters that you have written, the culture you have written, that could be the workshop and so on. There are many things before the game. Then the players come, you have to say welcome. You have to introduce them to what is going to happen, make sure that they are able to play the game. For some games you have done this before, for some of them they can come in the door and take five minutes and then they're ready to play. Then there is the run time and that covers all the controlling of the game while running. Then there is the off game. Do you need an off game place? Do you need rules so they can opt out of the game? Do you need a place they can go and uh, get warm and get sugar and coffee and so on? Do you need breaks? Some games use uh, theater style with acts so that you play 
for six hours, for instance, and then you have a break where you talk about how the game is going and then you go into the game again. Maybe you workshop during that time and then you go into the game again. And then at some point the game will end and you need to be able to control the players and uh, pack everything down and some kind of debrief. That could be, is everyone all right? Or that could be a whole day of debrief with talking and finding out who people are and partying together, uh, thinking about the experience. And then there is the after. And some games have a big impact and your role as a game master is not done. Uh, you will need to have two months of time to uh, check in with your players and see if they are all right. All of this is something you have to plan and think about as a game master. I hope I'm not scaring you right now. <laughs> but it's something that you have to think of. For small games, not that much. For big games, you need to think about it. Yes. Um, when we did the Delirium game, we were many organizers and the main organizers, we were four organizers. Two of them were in control of what I call the flow. That is the story, the pace of the game, that everything went according to the vision of how we wanted the game to run. And the two of us were in charge of safety, fire safety and so on, and the player safety. And then of course all the logistics and all the helpers we had doing the logistics. This turned into a trench war that the two organizers doing the flow of the game, trench war, this turned into a war where we had two sides sitting in each their trench and they didn't want to come up and communicate. So the whole running of the game was between one side the flow, the story, the narrative, the art of the game and on the other side the production, the safety of, of the players and so on. That is not smart. You should try to balance these and you should try to be enough people that you have the energy to manage all of these at the same time. When I talk about flow, um, Bjarke have been a bit into this, other people as well, but it could be events, could be that you want to have the big wedding, that uh, you want to have something specific to happen that will change the game or steer it in the right direction. It could be non-player characters, that could be yourself, be in the game and try to steer it, or that could be some special players that have more information than the others. That could be props and plot items, uh, that could be secrets, or that could be when we put the gun into the game, things will change. It can be simulating the outside world. If you play, for instance, um, World War II bunker, where the top of the world leaders is sitting and trying to find out what should happen. Then the rest of the outside world needs to be simulated by someone, and that someone is you as a game master. So I have to figure out what is China doing right now, and uh, if they do like this, then what will happen? Uh, if you want to know more about this, then Bjarke Pedersen is king of, uh, of this. He has done uh, vampire games in Crowd in Copenhagen for many, many years, and that is especially this skill. I'm very bad at it, uh, but there are someone here who knows more. Um, and that also go with coordinating players. Where are they? Where do they need to go? Uh, is there something they need to know that they don't know? And then the opening and closing of scenography, that could be outside if you play in the real world. They should go, go from uh, one factory building to another, then you need to have it ready and you need to close down the other one. Or that could be in a black box, for instance, that you open one island of light and you close down another. And then, as you saw in uh, when our destinies meet, as a game master, and that is the traditional meaning of game master, and also uh, from the freeform school, uh, very much what you do as a game master. You have to set the scenes, tell the players what is going to happen now, where are we, what are we going to do, and let the game play, and then cut the scene at the right time. Just like an editor in a movie say, this is the right time to, to cut the, the scene. Uh, and if you need to have gaps filled between these scenes to tell the story 
and make the players able to play uh, without having the story there, playing it themselves, but to give them enough information to play the, the islands of story. Does that make sense? Someone is nodding, good. <laughs> and then of course the safety. There's been a lot of talk about this, but it's the safety in the game that the players are feeling safe, the feeling of safety in the game, that they are able to step out of the game, uh, that you as a game master can step in, intervent, and if everything goes wrong, that you have an emergency plan. So if someone or something starts to light on fire, that you know what to do. And then this, the logistics, we haven't talked much about that. Uh, in Denmark, for instance, there is a whole school of designers that only think about this. A game is good if you are able to create these, that people have good food to eat, good place to sleep and there are toilets. That is a design principle that, at least in Denmark, is a very um, dominant design uh, principle. And you need to transport things around, be able to, uh, to know where things are at the right time. And if something goes wrong, then you, are, uh, you have to be able to control it. So these three things, there's a lot of work in these, but you have to be able to uh, balance it so you will not be overrun by one of them and forget the other. To do this you need people. This is from Delirium. We uh, had 80 lamps. Of course we needed someone who knew about lamps. If I had to do it myself it would be a catastrophe of a game. And you, if you need to do something specific, you need someone who can do it and you need to trust these people that they can do it and not opt out in the last second saying, oh, uh, I'm sick, I will not come to your game and you're standing there with 80 lamps on the floor looking at the ceiling thinking, how is this going to work? People is also important the way that they have some amount of energy and they will get tired. So be sure to take care of your co-organizers and yourself. Be sure to communicate while running the game so that you're sure that everyone knows where it's going and that they are happy. Because if you start the trench war during the game, then it will affect the players and the running of the game that you are not um, on the same page. And last but not least, keep calm and listen to your players. Both listen to your players so if they have any needs. For instance, this is the projection from Capo. Even if it took a lot of time for the organizers to change it every time someone wanted to go out of the game beforehand, it was necessary for the players to feel safe that they were able to go out of the game if they wanted to. So you need to be able to listen to them and change the game around them so they feel safe. And also, like Biage said earlier, listen to your players. If they're sitting there for 45 minutes with their glasses on and looking like they're not a part of the game, listen closely and you might experience that they're having a very good time. Don't panic, just keep calm. That is the best advice I could give to you. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Yep. I think you're wrong about one thing. Can I say it? Yes. Should I turn around to the room? It depends if it's a question or if you want to be a speaker for a minute. I want to be a speaker for 45 seconds. Stand up and say it. Go close there to Christopher so the mic might actually <laughs> I think there are three reasons why organizer fatigue should not be normal. It, is, it happens often, but you should not have organizer fatigue. We are stupid, but you can be smart. These are the three reasons. When you're tired, you become very bad at handling complexity. And you also become very bad with empathy. <laughs> empathy is the first thing to go and, and, the other, and the handling complexity. That means you cannot be a good game master. You become a bad game master if you're tired. The second is, you don't have empathy, 
it means you're a bad manager. And if you have a team of people who are working for you for free, you become rude and you demand impossible things and you don't listen to your co-workers and they will start to hate you and you will have a war in your organizer group. Third, a tired game master is an unsafe game master because you cannot prioritize your resources and you will make bad decisions. So yes, it's very common with big games that the organizers are tired, but it should not be normal, it should be wrong. Do you agree? Yes. Safety not in spoken. And when that is said, it is still normal. So if you stand there, <laughs> if you stand there and feel like, oh, I'm disappointing Jok, then it's, it's okay. <laughs>